안녕하세요. 네, 반갑습니다. 저는 주한 캐나다 대사관 상무과에 근무하고 있는 이현주 상무관이라고 합니다. 반갑습니다. 네, 오늘 이렇게 H2 및 어, 행사 기간 동안에 열리는 그 캐나다 데이 컨트리 세미나 어, 참석해 주셔서 진심으로 감사드리고요. 아침 일찍부터 어, 이렇게 서둘러 주셔서 어, 감사드립니다. 어, 오늘은 어, 저희가 이제 캐나다의 어, 수소 경제 관련해 가지고 수소에 대한 어떤 기회들 그리고 엘버타와 BC 주정부에서 어, 일단은 음, 진행하고 있는 어떤 수소에 대한 그런 프로젝트하고 기회들에 대해서 중심적으로 어, 발표를 할 예정입니다. 어, 지금부터 그 주한 캐나다 대사관 1등 서기관님으로 계시는 레진 라포인트 1등 서기관님 모시고 환영사를 듣도록 하겠습니다. 레진. 굿 모닝. 안녕하세요. Uh, as Hyunju kindly mentioned, my name is Regine Lapointe. I am first secretary at the Embassy of Canada to Korea. It is a real great pleasure to welcome all of you to the Canada Day seminar at H2Meet 2023. I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us. I would like to start by thanking the organizer of H2Meet, the organizing committee, including the Korea Automobile and Mobility Association, for giving us an opportunity to showcase Canada's capabilities and advantages in the area of hydrogen. I would also like to recognize the contribution of our partners, the Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association, Natural Resources Canada, and the provincial governments of Alberta and British Columbia. Now, as you know, Canada is a global supplier of choice for hydrogen solutions, with established strength all across the country. We've had a head start in establishing competitive at-scale hydrogen value chain due to our abundant natural resources, geography, technical expertise, and existing infrastructure. Canada's value proposition is as a reliable energy partner with a commitment to the rule of law and a stable economy, which favors long-term and mutually beneficial commercial relationships. Collaboration with partners such as Korea on hydrogen solutions, projects and trade will allow us to strengthen global energy security while pursuing our respective climate commitments. Today's seminar is an opportunity for you to learn more about Canada's hydrogen strategy and the progress, as well as hydrogen opportunities and advantages in the provinces of Alberta and British Columbia. After the seminar, I would encourage you strongly to visit the Canada Pavilion located at booth C10, where you can meet with world-leading Canadian hydrogen companies, including Ballard, Loop Energy, Powertech Lab, Testnet, Greenlight Innovation, and World Energy GH2. With that, thank you very much. Merci. I'm Samida. Thank you very much. 그럼 지금부터 그 저희 캐나다 천연자원부의 앤드류 헤스웰 디렉터께서 나오셔서 캐나다 하이드로젠 오퍼티뉴티에 대해서 발표를 하도록 하겠습니다. 앤드류. <웃음> 안녕하세요. Good morning uh, and bonjour. It's a pleasure for me to be here uh, with you today. Uh, Hyunju, thank you very much for uh, the introduction. Uh, my name is Andrew Haswell. I'm director responsible for trade policy and investment attraction at Natural Resources Canada. Um, Natural Resources Canada is the ministry within the government of Canada that has a mandate on energy, fuels, including clean fuels, critical minerals, and forestry. And the department is not just responsible for policy work. The department also has a proud tradition of research and innovation. I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Hyunju, Regine, and Ethan uh, from the Embassy of Canada here in Seoul for their efforts to put together a, a really great uh, Canadian presence at the show. Um, also for the Canada Pavilion, and, and just to echo the words of my, my colleagues, really uh, encourage you to, to stop by and uh, interact with the companies there. 
Uh, personally, I'm really happy to be back in Seoul. I had the honor of being here uh, last year with our former uh, Deputy Minister of Natural Resources, uh, John Hannaford, where Canada was warmly welcomed as a country of honour. I also want to say this has really been a, a remarkable year uh, for the Canada-South uh, Korea relationship in terms of celebrating uh, the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations. Uh, this year we've also signed a Memorandum of Understanding on Critical Minerals, the Clean Energy Transition and Energy Security that will really help both countries to further develop trade and investment opportunities. There we go. Thank you very much. So just maybe a little bit about the geopolitical context in which we find ourselves. Um, we're just coming off the G20 Leaders Summit uh, that concluded in India, where we're, I think we we're really reminded um, that energy security issues continue to, to be top of mind for governments, uh, particularly in dealing with the ongoing consequences of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, I think for Canada, um, we fully recognize the imperative uh, for our partners in Europe and Indo-Pacific to secure reliable sources of energy that also help our partners achieve their climate targets in keeping with the global energy transition. This has really dovetailed well with the Government of Canada's initiative for the Indo-Pacific strategy that was launched earlier by Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs where we've committed to further enhancing our relationship with Indo-Pacific partners. And I think for NRCAN in particular, we've had a real focus on South Korea. From our perspective, I think that Canada is well positioned to be a reliable partner and source of clean energy, clean technology and innovation. I think we also have a lot of expertise to share and we're really committed to working with our partners in the region to help reduce emissions and also to address environmental issues. I mean, overall, ta overall tackling climate change requires global solutions and climate stable, and a climate stable planet is dependent on everyone working together. Maybe moving to talk about Canada's um, resources. Canada is really one of the top uh, energy producing countries in the world. Um, you'll hear from our, our colleagues in Alberta uh, in particular about abundant natural gas reserves and world-class geological CO2 storage, making it ripe for CCUS technology. Canada also has large-scale biomass supply and freshwater resources. There is a significant undeveloped renewable and low-carbon low resources that will be important as part of the green energy transition. For Canada, it's also important to use technology to help ensure that the energy produced has as low carbon intensity as possible. So just as the title says, the hydrogen story is really a Canadian story. Canada has extensive experience in the area of hydrogen. We have more than 100 years of experience in developing hydrogen intellectual property and also many years of exporting fuel cells and technology. We've been a global leader in fuel cells for the past 40 years. The need to further develop clean fuels such as hydrogen is clear in order to help support Canada's own needs as well as the needs of our partners and our allies. Hydrogen will, and its derivatives will continue to be a key priority for Canada moving forward, particularly given the important role it will play in the clean energy transition. Looking a little bit about clean energy, clean energy really is the, the foundation for Canada's hydrogen production. As we know, there are a number of different pathways to produce hydrogen and its derivatives, but what's important about all of them is that the energy that it takes to produce them. And I think the, you know, the story here, and you'll hear from my uh, provincial colleagues about their own circumstances and how the companies in their regions um, are coming together with their various uh, projects. 
but looking, for example, at, the, um, at more than 83% of electricity in Canada is from non-emitting uh, sources. There is an abundance of untapped wind potential in the eastern provinces. There is the hydroelectricity. Canada is well placed to produce low carbon hydrogen, meeting the needs of our partners. Moving on to the hydrogen ammonia um, situation in Canada. So currently Canada is the fourth largest hydrogen producer in the world. Given the increasing focus on hydrogen, the Government of Canada has launched a hydrogen strategy back in 2020. The strategy sets out how Canada will increase its economic competitiveness, grow exports, attract investment, and create good, sustainable jobs across the country. The strategy highlights that hydrogen is accelerating the energy transition and will help Canada reach its net zero by 2050 objectives. There are ongoing projects across Canada that are focused on export markets, particularly on, in the Indo-Pacific region and in Europe. At last count, the publicly announced total of projects across Canada had a value of more than 36 billion Canadian dollars. This is a relatively new slide uh, for us, and it talks about some of the um, high potential projects uh, that are being developed across the country, um, but in particular in British Columbia, Alberta, and Atlantic Canada. Um, given um, you know, the needs for ports and transport infrastructure as well to support uh, export opportunities. Canada has excellent resources off of both coasts and investments are being made to enable export of hydrogen both to Europe and to Indo-Pacific markets. There are natural hubs and you'll hear from my colleagues um, being developed in Edmonton, Vancouver, uh, Sarnia Lambton, Hamilton, and Shawinigan, Quebec, um, that are really um, putting into motion what I think was set out in the hydrogen strategy. Canada now has low carbon hydrogen production in operation, and more significant production projects are in development, and include an air liquide 20 megawatt electrolyzer in Baconcourt, Quebec, uh, that began operating in 2021, and at the time was the largest electrolyzer plant in the world. There are obviously um, a div diverse range of projects, but uh, a number of projects in Atlantic Canada have been focused on exports to Europe, um, and multiple projects have progressed, including the Enerwinds, en Everwind Fuels and Bearhead Energy in Nova Scotia projects that plan to produce um, low carbon hydrogen and ammonia from wind energy with the intent of exporting to Europe. Some of the projects in Western Canada are focused on exports to Indo-Pacific markets with a total of 14 billion Canadian dollars in publicly announced projects, some of which plan to begin operation between 2026 and 2028. I think something else that's important to mention here as well is the, the ESG uh, considerations. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the efforts both within NRCAN but also those of major project proponents to have meaningful engagement with Canada's Indigenous communities, where projects will be built on or run through Indigenous territories. They are working hard to build mutually beneficial partnerships. There we go. So talking a little bit about Canada's competitive advantage. So the various projects that are ongoing right now in Canada are really testament to Canada's attractiveness as an investment destination. Um, each province and jurisdiction brings its advantages, but I would say overall, given the abundance of natural resources, clean energy that I talked about already, skilled labor, accessible shipping routes, um, you know, these are a number of uh, elements that have come together. Um, You'll also notice the investment tax uh, credit element there, and these are also um, a key factor that I'll get into a little bit more on the next slide. So 
So as part of um, uh, Budget 2023, so the Canadian government's federal budget that was released earlier this year, the Government of Canada announced various tax investment credits to facilitate investment into Canada's clean energy and clean technology sectors. The tax credits that were announced are worth more than 60 billion, that's billion with a B, dollars over 10 years. This is really part of uh, Canada's um, noticing the development such as in the US with the IRA and in Europe. So um, these are really significant measures. So we're here talking about hydrogen. So for hydrogen in particular, um, they're developing a clean hydrogen investment tax credit that will include between 15 and 40 tax percent tax credits depending on life cycle carbon intensity and meeting certain labor requirements with an additional 15% for ammonia production. So I will say, so these were the measures that were announced in the budget. Um, my colleagues at Canada's Department of Finance, so the finance department that enacts the budget, are working right now to finalize the technical details of these plans, and that work is underway uh, right now, but it is advancing. I did also want to mention a couple of the other tax credits. So for example, there was also a carbon capture use and sequestration storage tax, investment tax credit based on the fraction of carbon dioxide stored permanently, a clean electricity and clean technology tax credit to support renewables, a clean technology manufacturing tax credit that would apply to equipment used to produce hydrogen from electrolysis. The important thing that I would add here is that these investment tax credits were designed to be stackable. So as I said, the details will, will come out soon, but it really brings together, as you can see, um, a suite of measures um, that uh, really contributes to Canada's competitiveness to attract investment. So there continues to be strong interest in investing in Canada's hydrogen industry and a long list of international partners who've approached Canada for collaboration. So in addition to the MOU that I mentioned earlier with South Korea on critical minerals, um, there was also back in August, Canada signed a declaration of intent to establish a hydrogen alliance with Germany to contribute to collaboration on hydrogen exports. Back in 2021, Canada also signed an MOU with the Netherlands on hydrogen collaboration. Canada has an agreement with the United States to jointly identify green corridors and cross-border hydrogen hubs. Other countries, as you see there, are turning to Canada to secure supply arrangements and looking to benefit from Canadian technological expertise. So as I mentioned um, earlier this year, we had a visit from um, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, and really there was a, there's been a good deal of momentum to build on um, the relationship between Canada and South Korea. Um, back earlier in my career, I had the opportunity to work on the negotiations uh, for the Canada-Korea uh, Free Trade Agreement, um, and you know, uh, there was just a, a lot of really great um, uh, collaborations going on. You know, back in uh, 2022, there was the POSCO announcement. Um, so, you know, there are, I, I don't need to read the slide there, but uh, really strong uh, relationships between Canada and South Korea. So that is, that is my presentation. Um, I thank you uh, very much. I know across the um, suite of presenters from, from Canada, I think you'll get a really good uh, picture of the, um, the, the situation in Canada vis-a-vis -vis hydrogen. Again, uh, I would encourage you to stop by and uh, visit the pavilion and interact with the, the great Canadian companies that are here. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
그 지금 보신 프레젠테이션 자료가 혹시 필요하시면 저희가 캐나다 국가관이 C 10 10번 호거든요. 그쪽으로 오셔서 저에게 이제 자료 요청을 해주시면 은 저희 대사관에서 어 요청한 자료를 어 보내드 PDF 포맷으로 보내드리도록 하겠습니다. 그리고 이제 안내를 해드려야 되는데 제가 깜빡했는데요. 어 저희 지금 동시통역 진행되고 있어서요. 5번 리시버 5번은 한국어, 리시버 6번은 영어로 지금 진행이 되고 있습니다. 예, 다음에는 저희 주한 캐나다 대사관에 같이 어 이제 있는 알버타 주정부 대표 어, 사무소가 있습니다. 대표부가 있습니다. 한국 대표부의 어, 대표이신 빅토리 대표님을 모시고 그 알버타 콜라보레이션 오퍼티니티스 위드 알버타를 주제로 해서 어, 발표를 시작하도록 하겠습니다. 큰 박수 부탁드리겠습니다. 오케이, okay. uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Lee. I'm the Alberta uh, Government Office Director, so Director of the Alberta Korea Office here at the Canadian Embassy in Seoul. For the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'll be introducing the collaboration opportunities between Korea and Alberta, especially in the blue hydrogen. And with that, uh, I have originally prepared my presentation in English, but since all of you uh, prefer to speak and listen to Korean language, I'm happy to present in Korean as well. Just a quick background. Uh, I grew up in Canada, but my mother is a Korean language teacher, so I had to learn Korean every evening and weekend. So I'm glad that my uh, hard effort is now wasted. Uh, I'll speak Korean from going forward. By the way, uh, 혹시 알버타에 가보셨던 분이 계신가요? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, 혹시 알버타에 대해서 들어보신 적이 있다 한번 손 한번 들어봐 주시겠어요? Heard about Alberta? 예, 한 10% 정도 되시는 것 같습니다. 그럼 알버타에 대해서 짧게 소개를 하고 저희 프레젠테이션 uh, 시작하겠습니다. 저희 알버타 주는 uh, 캐나다. 캐나다에서 어, 저희 food security and energy security 파트너로 지금 한국과 어, 정말 많은 협력을 하고 있습니다. 한국으로 수출되고 있는 가스, 또 LPG, 또 어, 제철소에서 쓰이고 있는 석탄, 메탈러지컬 콜들이 지금 어, 알버타 주에서 수출이 되고 있고요. 또 저희는 파이프라인 배관 안전 관련해서도 한국 정부와 한국 기업과 콜라보레이션을 많이 하고 있습니다. 또한 음식, 푸드 앤 에그리컬처 쪽으로 보면 캐나다에서 한국으로 수출되는 90%의 소고기가 저희 알버타주에서 나오고 있는 트리플 A 소고기이고요. 또 메이저 어, 한국의 베이커리에서도 저희 곡물, 그레인이 많이 쓰이고 있습니다. 또한 김연아 선수가 어, 저희 이번에 한국과 캐나다 육, 수교 60주년일 때 명예대사로서 또 저희 알버타주에 있는 뱀프 앤 레이크 루이스에 와서 또 홍보도 하고 어, 갔습니다. 뿐만 아니라 저희는 sub national level에서 강원도 어, 강원 특별 자치도와 sister province가 된지 이제 내년이면 50주년입니다. 그래서 저희는 한국과 어, 캐나다가 수교 60주년이 올해 또 내년에는 한국 강원도와 또 알버타 주정부의 수교 50주년 이렇게 어, long time으로 콜라보레이션을 하고 있습니다. 아, 저는 딱세 가지의 아젠다를 가지고 발표를 하겠습니다. 아, 저희 인트로듀스 알버라 아까 10% 분이 알버타에 대해서 알고 또 방문을 하셨다고 하셨는데 나머지 90%의 분들에게 아, 저희를 소개를 하고 저희 알버타의 하이드로진 로드맵에 대해서 설명을 하고 또 콜라보레이션 오퍼티니티에 대해서 잠깐 설명을 하겠습니다. 음, 그 전에 먼저 짧은 저희 알버타 주에 대한 동영상을 먼저 보고 시작하겠습니다.
from the boreal forests in the north to the badlands in the south, Alberta is home to four and a half million world-class dreamers and out-of-the-box innovators, including a quarter million people of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit heritage who play an important role in the fabric of the province. With the world's fourth largest energy reserves, Alberta produces more than three quarters of Canada's energy exports and was the first jurisdiction to put a price on industrial carbon. Through innovation, we continue to build a world-class, diversified energy sector Alberta's energy is produced under the most stringent standards in the world. And we are investing billions more to develop technologies to further reduce and eliminate emissions. While demand for greener energy grows, oil and gas will remain essential for several decades. And Alberta will continue to provide a reliable supply of affordable, responsibly produced energy. Alberta's energy assets are spread across 882,000 square kilometers of diverse landscape. In the Northeast, you'll find the core of Alberta's strategic oil and gas sector, where most of our oil reserves are found, and Albertan ingenuity is put into action. Environmental and reclamation scientists have played a key role in Alberta's oil sands from day one, and continue to build on our legacy of reclaiming and protecting natural spaces. In the Northwest, Alberta's natural gas producers prepare to export liquid natural gas to the West Coast. Under some of the toughest environmental and safety standards, the pipeline that's been shipping Alberta energy to the world since 1953 is being expanded. In the center of the province, an exciting mix of research, new technologies, and field expertise is fueling the development of the province's energy future. From petrochemicals and bitumen beyond combustion, to clean hydrogen and carbon capture. Travel south and you'll find Alberta's energy business, research and transportation hub home to a young, educated, and skilled workforce. East of the Canadian Rockies, rugged terrain gives way to sweeping southern prairies, an area ideally suited to wind, solar, and renewable power generation. Energy opportunities span the province, connecting to opportunities around the globe. With a secure, affordable, and responsible source of energy, unparalleled expertise and innovation, and a clear vision, the future of energy lives here. あの、株主じゃ 어, 현재 저희 알버타 주정부는 어, 전 세계 어, 16 different location 어, 보통 캐나다 대사관이나 총영사관 안에 저희 주정부 외교관들이 파견되어 나가 있습니다. 아까 말씀드린 대로 알버타가 캐나다의 에코노믹 파워하우스라고 한 이유는 GDP 성장률에서도 이렇게 볼 수가 있습니다. 
아까 동영상으로도 잠깐 보셨지만 어, 저희 오일 앤 가스 인더스트리, 그다음에 에그리 푸드 인더스트리 이쪽이 워낙에 강한 이유는 저희 웨스턴 캐나다 세드멘트리 베이슨이라는 캐나다 서부 퇴적 분지가 저희 알버타 주 그리고 브리티시 콜롬비아 사스카 주한 주에 이렇게 있는데 그 중에 메인이 알버타 주고 또 캐나다에서 생산되는 오일의 80% 내추럴 가스의 70% 정도가 저희 주에서 생산이 되고 있습니다. 그렇기 때문에 그쪽과 관련된 어, 에너지 기업도 많이 있고 또 R&D 콜라보레이션 할수 있는 기회도 많이 있습니다. 현재 저희가 생산하고 있는 토탈 에너지 프로덕션은 어, 전 세계 생산의 4위 정도이고 5 million barrel per day 어, 정도로 지금 석탄, 어, 오일, 가스, 페트로케미컬스, 오일 샌드 아, 뭐 이런 식의 모든 커머디티를 통합해서 인크리즈를 하고 있습니다. 하지만 아, 히스토리컬 드릴링 액티비티를 보시면 드릴링 액티비티는 점점점 줄어들고 있습니다. 그 이유는 저희 인더스트리의 키워드가 increase efficiency, 효율을 높이고 또 코스트를 줄이고 reducing operation cost and reducing greenhouse gas emission. 그래서 저희는 에너지 쪽또 하이드로젠 쪽에 그런 블루 하이드로젠 쪽에 음, 리, 글로벌 리더라고 할수 있습니다. 어, 아마 메이저 에너지 컴퍼니즈 인 알버다 리스트를 보시면 어, 오일 앤 가스 컴퍼니, 파이프라인 컴퍼니, 페트로 케미컬 컴퍼니들 또 글로벌 리더들이 다 저희 알버타 주의 헤드쿼터를 가지고 있는 걸 보실 수 있을 겁니다. 음, 뿐만 아니라 한국에 있는 아, 가스공 한국에서 온 가스공사 그 다음 석유공사가 저희 캘, 알버타 캘거리의 헤드쿼터를 가지고 있고 또 메이저 에너지 컴퍼니스 프롬 코리아 한국의 에너지 기업들이 저희와 지금 트레이드 앤 인베스트먼트 R&D를 하고 있습니다. 음, 그리고 여기가 아까 90% 분들이 못 가보신 캘거리의 그 에너지 기업들이 헤드쿼터를 하고 있는 정말 살기 좋은 어, 곳입니다. 그럼 이제 아, 지금부터 10분 정도 알버타 하이드로젠 로드맵에 대해서 설명을 하고 콜라보레이션 어퍼티니티에 대해서 설명을 하겠습니다. 알버타 하이드로젠 로드맵의 메인 비전은 아, 수소의 생산, 연구, 또 혁신 분야의 핵심 주자로서 알버타주가 캐나다 수소의 활용에 아, 또 경제 에코노믹 디벨롭먼트 크리에이션, 경제 활동의 리더가 될수 있도록 정부가 비전을 제시하고 정책을 만드는 그런 로드맵입니다. Production and Storage, Transportation and End Use 이쪽에 관련된 그런 폴리시를 저희가 만드는 겁니다. 그럼 이걸 왜 Federal Government랑 또 주정부가 같이 하느냐라고 물으신다면 어, 캐나다에 있는 헌법, Canadian Constitutional Reference를 저희가 해야 될것 같습니다. 어, 캐나다에서는 현재 주정부가 어, Natural Gas, Natural Resources에 생산, 그다음에 관리, 그다음에 규제 쪽에 관련된 법률을 또 폴리시를 관리하도록 주정부의 관리하에 있도록 되어 있습니다. 어, Federal Government에서 아까 앤드류가 말한 것처럼 저희 캐나다의 Hydrogen Strategy가 나왔고 또 저희 알버타 주정부도 그걸 서포트하면서 또 메시징을 온라인하면서 저희 주정부 안에서의 Hydrogen Roadmap을 이제 발표를 하고 주정부와 Federal Government가 같이 협력을 하고 있습니다. 2030년까지 아, 2003, 알버타가 2030년까지 액션 플랜을 좀 포커스를 하고 있고 캐나다의 하이드로젠 스트레티지는 좀더 롱거 텀 비전으로 2050년까지의 비전을 제시하고 있습니다. 어, 저희는 세 가지 카테고리로 볼 수가 있는데 폴리시 필러, 그다음에 마켓 디벨롭먼트, 어치빙 아웃컴. 그래서 이 로드맵 안에서 알버타 정부가 정, 정책을 이렇게 만들고 그 안에서 새로운 마켓을 서포트를 해주고 그걸 통해서 탈탄소화, 또 경제 창출, 또 알버타에서 생산되는 블루 하이드로진의 수, 아, 수출을 포커스를 하고 있습니다. 그 중에서도 정책 쪽에서는 아, 탄소의 포집과 저장, 투자 유치, 혁신, 효율, 그리고 네트워크 구축 이쪽에 포커스를 두고 있습니다. 그래서 이 알버타 하이드로젠 로드맵 안에서 캐나다의 첫 번째이자 어, 제일 큰 알버타 하이드로젠 센터 오브 엑셀런스 하이드로젠과 관련해서는 이제 제일 큰 센터 오브 엑셀런스 혁신 센터가 저희 알버타 주에 이제 생겼습니다. 그리고 이 센터 안에서 저희는 세, 어, 많은 연구와 또 공동 어, 과제 개발 어, 등을 하고 있습니다. 
Hydrogen Center of Excellence에서 저희가 포커스를 하는 것 중에 한국과 관련돼서 저희가 하이라이트 하고 싶은 부분은 글로벌 파트너십 그리고 새로운 테크놀로지가 한국에서 개발되거나 아니면 알버타에서 같이 개발이 되었을 때 파일럿 테스팅, 아, 파일럿 패실리티 앤 테스팅 서비스 그리고 코드와 스탠다드를 같이 만드는 한국 산업 통상 자원부에서 항상 어, 발표하는 이런 한국의 좋은 기술이 있지만 그거를 다른 나라에서 이제 사, 활용이 안 된다고 할때 저희 알버타 주에서 테스팅을 하고 또 파트너십을 가지고 음, 콜라 그런 코드 앤 스탠다드, 세이프티 이쪽에 좀더 포커스를 둬서 같이 개발된 그런 아니면 같이 만들어진 회사를 통해 또 글로벌 엑스포트 어, 수출도 할수 있는 그런 경제 활동에 에코노믹 디벨롭먼트에 포커스를 두고 있습니다. 저희 주 정부 관리 하에 있는 주 정부 연구 단체입니다. 이노텍 알버타 앤 시퍼 테크놀로지스 두 개의 기관은 어, 아마 한국 정부나 기관에서 또 기업에서 같이 할수 있는 어, 정말 글로벌 파트너로 하기 좋은 기관입니다. 어, 한국과 벌써 많은 콜라보레이션을 하고 있고요. 안 파이프라인 파이프라인 세이프티 특히 어, 수소 파이프라인의 그런 이로전, 크로전 아니면은 뭐 leak detection, 아, explosion에 관련된 그런 prevention, 혹은 maintenance, storage 관련된 부분에서 새로운 기술을 개발하거나 테스팅하거나 하는 아, 기관이 될수 있을 것 같습니다. 아, 시간 관계상 저희가 다른 government funding 프로그램들이 있지만 이거는 웹사이트에도 다 나와 있기 때문에 나중에 아, 따로 break time이나 아니면 저한테 이메일로 연락을 주시면 share를 해드리, 해드리겠습니다. 그 중에 highlight 하고 싶은 프로젝트가 하나가 있는데. 캐나다의 첫 번째 100% 수소 도시에 대한 R&D 연구와 또 펀딩도 저희 알버타 주에서 하고 있습니다. 그럼 한국과 알버타의 콜라보레이션 오퍼티니티는 어떤 게 있을까라는 퀘스천을 가지고 어, 보면 Korea's Hydrogen Strategy가 이렇게 나와 있는데 알버타는 Strong Partner, Strong Economic Partner에서 저희 블루 하이드로젠 특히 블루 수소에 포커스를 둔 그런 파트너가 될수 있을 것 같습니다. 음, 2019년에 한국 정부가 어, 수소 경제 활성화 로드맵, 하이드로젠 이코노미 로드맵을 바, 발표하고 그 안에서 네 개의 키 에리아, 어, 수소 공급, 또 수소의 저장과 운송, 활용, 또 네트워크 앤 이코노미 빌딩을 포커스로 하고 있습니다. 그 중에서도 장, 어, 2020 2021년 어, 제1차 수소 경제 이행 기본 계획 Master Plan for Implementing Hydrogen Economy라는 그런 플랜이 나왔는데 그 중에 보면 15개의 키 액션 플랜이 한국 정부에서 하이라이트를 하고 있습니다. 그 중에서 저희가 포커스를 할수 있는 건 블루 하이드로젠의 생산, 내추럴 가스에서 나오는 블루 하이드로젠의 생산, Overseas Clean Hydrogen Production, 해외에서의 어, 내, 그런 블루 하이드로젠에 대한 생산을 알버타 주에서 같이 할수 있을 것 같습니다. 현재 저희는 연간 250만 톤, 2.5 million tons of blue hydrogen을 지금 생산을 하고 있, 있습니다. 그 중에 한 50%는 oil, heavy oil upgrading에 쓰이고 있고 한 30%가 chemical industry, 아, 그리고 나머지가 뭐 oil refining 쪽에 쓰이고 있는데 그게 한 2030년 이후에는 지금 이야기하기로는 뭐 천만 톤 프로덕션까지 갈수 있도록 여러 가지 메이저 프로젝트들이 지금 아나운스먼트가 되어 있습니다. 그런 메이저 프로젝트는 제 발표 다음에 있는 인더스트리얼 하일랜드에서 조금 더 커버를 할수 있을 것 같습니다. 어, 뿐만 아니라 저희 인프라스트럭처, 빌딩 언 네이션 와이즈 인프라스트럭처, 특히 하이드로젠에 대한 그런 배관에서도 저희가 캐나다의 85만 킬로미터의 파이프라인 중 저희 50%가 저희 알버타 주에 있습니다. 그렇기 때문에 배관 안전도 어, 한국과 또 다른 나라와 저희 알버타 주가 항상 콜라보레이션을 해왔기 때문에 아, 세이프티 관련된 그런 인프라스트럭처도 연구나 같은 프로젝트 디벨롭먼트를 할수 있을 것 같습니다. 또한 아, 수소의 활용, 안전한 수소의 운송과 저장, 한국 정부에서 필요로 하는 에너지 세큐리티, 에너지 안보 쪽으로도 저희가 같이 콜라보레이션을 할수 있을 것 같습니다. 또한 마지막으로 아, 글로벌 이코 시스템을 만들기에 저희 캐나다와 한국이 아, 글로벌 파트너이고 또 한, 수교 60주년을 통해서 저희 한국과 캐나다의 릴레이션십이 그냥 프렌드십에서 베스트 프렌드 
뭐 Stronger Together라는 모토 아예 이제 좀더 어, 강하게 되었습니다. 그래서 그 안에서 여러 펀딩 프로젝트와 또 기업 간의 협력이 가능할 것 같습니다. 어, 현재 알버타와 하이드로진이라고 했을 때 success story 아니면은 뭐 key outcome를 볼수 있을 것 같습니다. 캐나다 알버타에 들어오는 100% 수소 마을 공동체 또 알버타 주에서 쓰이게 되는 하이드로진 버스나 또 지금은 아직 실용은 안돼 있지만 어, 디스커션이 나오고 있는 트럭과 뭐 트램 에너지 트랜지션에서 저희 한국과 같은 공동 연구 또한 한국의 이원 코리아가 또 저희 알버타 주에서 생산되는 블루 수소의 오프테이크 어그리먼트와 인베스트먼트에도 이제 아나운스먼트를 했고요. 또 여러 인프라스트럭처 프로젝트, 특히 에어포트나 아니면 뭐 내셔널 파크 같은데 하이드로진으로 되는 수소 트랜스포테이션, 모빌리티 등에 관련된 기회도 있을 것 같습니다. 블루 하이드로진으로만 봤을 때는 아, 뭐 다른 모든 커머디티도 그렇지만 캐나다 서부에서 한국으로 수출되는 게한 배로 10일에서 11일 정도라면 아, 뭐 호주에서 오는 게 11일에서 12일 그다음에 뭐 미국 걸프 코스트에서 오는 게한 25일 또뭐 중동에서 오는 것도 한 18일 정도 되기 때문에 트랜스포테이션으로만 보더라도 캐나다 서부에서 아, 시, 한국으로 수출하는 게 훨씬 더 이펙티브합니다. 그렇기 때문에 LNG, 코, LNG 캐나다 프로젝트도 저희가 계속 푸싱을 하고 있고 또 한국에 있는 메이저 오일 기업들도 한, 아, 알버타에 있는 오일 수출을 이제 서부를 통해서 갈수 있도록 지금 많은 연구와 또 콜라보레이션을 하고 있습니다. 그래서 이런 기회를 통해서 더 많은 한국 기업들이 어, 여기에 석세스 스토리에 나올 수 있도록 저희는 어, 같이 일을 하고 싶습니다. 아, 마지막으로 어, 캐나다에서 열리는 제일 큰 수소 컨퍼런스도 저희 알버타 주에 있는 에드먼튼 저희 주 도에서 매년 열리고 있습니다. 어, 내년 4월에 있을 예정이니 혹시 관심이 있으시면 저희 알버타 주정부 한국 대표부 어, 주한 캐나다 대사가 안에 있는 저희 팀을 통해 연락을 주시면 저희가 페더럴 가버먼트, 프로빈셜 가버먼트, 또 뮤니스퍼 가버먼트와 같이 콜라보레이션을 해서 어, 서포트를 하겠습니다. 저희가 준비한 자료는 여기까지입니다. 아, 들어가 주셔서 감사합니다. <웃음> 아, 네, 감사합니다. 아마 알버타 주의 그 수소 현황에 대해서 어, 잘 설명을 해주셔가지고 많은 정보가 됐을 것이라고 생각됩니다. 빅터 대표님 감사드리고요. 다음은 어, 말씀드린 것처럼 알버타 지역에 있는 어, 어떻게 보면 산업 단지인데요. 그 알버타 인더스트리얼 헐랜드에서 어, 지금 인프라스트럭처 쪽에 그 비즈니스 디벨롭먼트 매니저로 계시는 사라 스타일러 씨가 나오셔가지고 그 다, 어, 알버타 인더스트리얼 헐랜드에 대한 전반적인 소개를 간단하게 해드리도록 하겠습니다. 굿모닝에브리원스크리어너프로미투비히어앤쉐어위스유어바더워크워드윙앳어버다스인더스트리얼하트랜드어소시에이션마이컬리그프롬더페더럴거버먼트앤프롬프로빈셜거버먼트알레
So Alberta's industrial heartland are the two red boxes. And that's 582 square kilometers of uh, heavy industrial zoned land. So when I say heavy industrial zoning, that means this area is majority zoned as heavy industrial. So any companies wants to come here and build industrial projects, they do not have to go through rezoning um, compared to some other areas in province. Uh, that saves them about 12 months to eight months of time. As of today, um, the Heartland is Canada's largest hydrocarbon processing center. Um, we already have over $45 billion of investment being operational as of today, and that's Canadian dollars. Um, AIH is home to over 40 companies, uh, mainly oil and gas refinery, downstream petrochemical processing, as well as advanced manufacturing sectors. And here are um, a, about 40, 30 companies that already have existing operational assets in our region. There's a lot of names you probably already recognized, such as Shell has a refinery here, uh, Impure Oil, which is a Canadian branch of ExxonMobil, uh, Lindy, Dow, Chevron, so some really global big names are here. Here are some of the existing industry and industries and products in our area. Um, because we are not just a concept, uh, we already have industrial assets, so we are producing those products as of today. So from the left-hand side, you can see there's quite a bit of chemicals produced here, uh, mainly polyethylene, ethylene, um, propylene, polypropylene, ethylene glycol, ethylene oxide, and the majority of the, uh, the products here, they're um, using natural gas as feedstock. Um, we also have four refineries in our region. So we have gasoline, diesel, aromatics produced from those refineries as well. Um, we also have two uh, fertilizer facilities here and nitrogen fertilizers. So that's mainly ammonia, ammonia sulfate, and a urea. So it's interesting about the ammonia fertilizer facility here is because it's already tapped into the CCUS uh, system, so we are producing blue ammonia as of today, mainly supplying to the agriculture uh, industry in North America. In terms of midstream and utility products and industries, a majority of the uh, assets are natural gas fractionation facilities. So uh, those facilities will produce butane and propane and condensate mainly to, uh, the, to supply the oil, the crude oil pipelines. Um, we do have over 40 salt cavern storage as well. And majority of the storage are used to uh, store natural gas liquids or natural gas liquids products. Um, there are some research projects going on right now to look into using the caverns to store hydrogen underground as well, uh, which saves a lot of operational cost for hydrogen storage. Um, we do have two operating world-class, world-scale CCUS system as well, and I will talk about those two in details later. Um, there are some diversified products produced in our region, and um, such as high purity nickel and high purity cobalt, mainly produced by a company called Sherid. And that's one of the oldest facility in our area, about 60 years old already. We do have um, Umocore produced nickel composite and cobalt powders as well for coatings. Uh, Ivonic from a uh, German company produce a uh, significant amount of hydrogen peroxide as well. And there's also uh, Priot software produced in our region, uh, mainly to supply the Asia Pacific market as well as US fertilizer market. When it comes to hydrogen, Edmonton is the first hydrogen hub announced in Canada. Um, the Heartland uh, AIHA is leading the work related to production. So we're hoping to uh, attract more hydrogen or hydrogen carrier production facilities to be built in our region. And here are some of the recent announcements in our area. On the very left-hand side, you can see the uh, uh, inter-pipeline project completed recently. I believe um, on, in Victor's video, he also showed the inter-pipeline, the real cars full of polypropylene plastic resins as well. And this facility is the first, is Canada's first propane dehydrogenation 
and propylene production facility. Uh, it's a world-class facility as well, mainly to supply the U.S. market. And this facility also received Alberta Petrochemical Incentive um, funding as well. Uh, it, it cost it about uh, $6 billion to build this facility. And I believe they received um, over $400 million from the province as incentive. Uh, two projects are under construction right now. Um, Wolf Midstream, which is backed by Canada Pension, um, is building the NGL North, which is a comprehensive natural gas liquids recovery, transportation, and fractionation facility. Um, Shell has a refinery in our area, and they're building a 58 megawatt solar farm, uh, mainly to decarbonize their current refining, refining uh, operation. Uh, quite a few projects related to hydrogen um, that are under study right now, and some of the projects will go through uh, feasible. They're going through feasibility uh, or pre-feed uh, stage right now, and hoping to be FID by end of this year or 2024. Um, project uh, Dow is looking at right now is Canada's first. It was actually the world's first net zero integrated ethane cracking facility. Um, this project is very interesting because Dow is producing hydrogen um, as part of the ethane cracking process. Um, but uh, for the new project, Dow is looking at using hydrogen on site uh, to feed into their crackers and also uh, tripling their on site ethylene and polyethylene generation capacity. Of all of the industrial parks in the world, Dow is looking at to build the first net zero facility in our area in the heartland, and that is really good uh, marketing for us, actually. Um, so Shell and the Mitsubishi is looking at uh, building a, um, uh, a hydrogen, a blue hydrogen uh, facility utilizing CCS as well, mainly supplying the products to Asian market. Uh, Itotru, Petronas, and Interpipeline. So Interpipeline, if you recall, is the one that built the uh, first polypropylene facility. Um, so the three companies are, um, look, are studying currently uh, a blue ammonia and a blue methanol facility right now. And the scale is about 1.8 million tons per year. So really large scale, also utilizing uh, the existing CCS. On the very left is Sancor and Echo. Both are Canadian companies. So Sancor has a refinery in the Heartland area. Um, so Sancor and Echo are building are planning to build a blue hydrogen, hydrogen project. About 50% of the hydrogen will be supplied to Sancor's refinery and used as part of the hydrogenation process in the refinery. Uh, about 20% will be supplied to the Alberta, will be supplied to power generation to decarbonize Alberta grid, electricity grid. On the right hand side, so Pambina and Marabini. Are, uh, have signed MOU uh, to link, look into building a blue ammonia facility as well. I believe that's also 1 million tons per year of scale, so fairly large scale using CCS, and the plan is to ship the products to either a Japan or Korea market. Uh, very right-hand side is ATCO is working with Kasai Power, um, also planning to build a blue hydrogen and blue ammonia facility as well. As well, so you heard about me talking about blue hydrogen, blue ammonia many times. Uh, it's because um, the advantage in Alberta is really abundant and cheap natural gas, as well as existing CCS infrastructure. And I will talk about those in details. Um, it's not listed here, but there's a Korean company, Hydrogen Canada, is also studying to build a blue hydrogen and blue ammonia facility as well. And I believe they're working with E1, E1 right now. So altogether, about seven blue hydrogen and blue ammonia projects right in the industrial heartland. So as my provincial colleague Victor mentioned earlier, um, we really have abundant natural gas. Last time I checked, Alberta has the second largest natural gas and oil reserves in the world. So we have a lot of natural gas. Based on the current production volume and production level, we can have a steady supply of natural gas for more than 200 years without any problems. Um, because the natural gas is oversupplied in Alberta, um, so give you a little bit um, of stats here about um, 
a third of natural gas produced in Alberta is consumed in domestic market. About two thirds are um, exported to mainly U.S. market. So because the U.S. is our main market, uh, the price in Alberta is traded at discounted price. So if you look at the stats in the last 17 or 20 years, uh, the price in Alberta, the benchmark is called ACO, uh, is traded at about 50 cents to a dollar, US dollar per MMBTO discounted price compared to Henry Hub. And as you know, um, natural gas is one of the key um, components of the operational cost for blue hydrogen and blue ammonia production. So because natural gas is cheapest in North America, in Alberta, uh, the cost of hydrogen production is also the lowest in North America. And I'm talking about blue hydrogen and the blue ammonia um, production. So if you look at the research that was done by Asia Pacific Research Center about three years ago, um, Canada is a second from the bottom here. So that's Canada natural gas plus CCS. Second from the bottom, um, a little bit more expensive than Russia, uh, but cheapest in North America, probably cheapest in the world as well. Cheaper than green hydrogen too. When other countries are looking at building their first CCUS infrastructure or projects, we already have uh, world-class CCUS infrastructure in place today. So the left-hand side um, is a um, joint venture between CNRL, uh, Shell and Chevron, um, but operated by Shell is a project called Shell Quest. So they will capture this project will capture the CO2 coming off of Shell Upgrader in the heartland, um, and the scale is uh, over one million tons of CO2 per year. And it's operational since 2015. As of today, it has captured more than I believe seven million tons of CO2 already. The right hand side is ACTL. Alberta Carbon Trunkland Project is Alberta's first large-scale um, CC, CCUS project. It's operated by Wolf Midstream. Um, the majority of the CO2 is transported to um, a town south of the city of Edmonton, close to Red Deer, about two hours away. Um, the scale is 14 million tons per year. So this project has been operational since 2017. So really large scale projects. So the projects, the ACTL projects, originates from industrial heartland and it connects with uh, the ammonia facility in our area. And that's why I said earlier, uh, the ammonia produced in the heartland is already blue ammonia. Last August, uh, there were six CCUS projects announced in Alberta. And out of the six projects, five of them are uh, next to uh, our industrial park or very close to our industrial park. We can easily connect to the emitters in our area. And majority of the projects announced here are uh, between 10 million tons to 20 million tons per year of scale. So really large scale. I'll quickly talk about global market access. I think Victor talked about this already. Uh, we did a study last year uh, looking at shipping, uh, transit time on vessels from West Coast in British Columbia to uh, East Asia. So from there are two main ports in Canada on the West Coast is uh, Prince Rupert and Vancouver. So from Prince Rupert, it is the shortest transit time in West Coast take about uh, 11 to 12 days uh, from Rupert to uh, Busan or Tokyo. From Vancouver, one or two days longer. So really short transit time compared to US Gulf Coast. Um, I believe US Gulf Coast will be about a month because it has to go through Panama Canal. So your uh, west, our west coast, the vessels do not have to go through Panama Canal. What I didn't show here today is uh, the rail network we have two class one railways in North America that go through the Heartland area, our industrial park, and they connect it to a lot of the industrial um, projects, industrial assets already. Um, so we're sitting on the mainland of both of the class one railway networks, connect us to the West Coast, East Coast, and all the way to Mexico. Very comprehensive government support for hydrogen uh, development and other industrial development as well. 
Um, so Andrew, our federal colleague, mentioned about the CCUS tax credit um, for CCUS uh, equipment and clean hydrogen investment tax credit as well as clean manufacturing tax credit. So I won't go into details here, um, but there are significant incentive funding programs um, by the federal government. So in the province, we have Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program. So that's up to 12% of eligible capital cost can be returned to the project proponents once the project is completed. completed. Um, so the inter pipeline projects that I mentioned earlier, they received about 10% from the, fed, uh, the provincial government. So that significant incentive uh, can be granted to different projects related to petrochemicals. Uh, there's also Emission Reduction Alberta, which is a provincial government agency as well. They have multiple um, funding programs as well for uh, various strategic projects, mainly from technology readiness level six to nine. Um, we, what's very unique for our industrial park is the municipal incentives. As I mentioned earlier, we are funded by five municipalities. So all of, all of the municipalities in our area uh, is participating in the Heartland Incentive Program. That's up to 2.5% of the capital costs can be returned to project, propo uh, project proponents via either property tax incentive or uh, via infrastructure support. So all of the incentives are stack stackable. So you can potentially get um, a whole bunch of money from the federal government, provincial and the municipal government. One unique uh, regulatory framework that only exists in our industrial park is the designated industrial zone. Now this, um, this program is uh, a collaboration between our association and the province of Alberta. Is to, the goal is to streamline the regulatory approval at the provincial level um, to uh, four different industrial projects. Last time I chatted with the uh, working team, we can reduce the approval timeline uh, down to six or seven months. That is very competitive compared to other jurisdictions in the world. Um, that's a lot of information. Um, happy to answer any questions. I guess I did a really good presentation. <laughs> Uh, we do have a booth in the Canada Pavilion. Feel free uh, to drop by. Thank you. Uh, 네, 감사합니다. Uh, 다음은 저희가 뉴지오 호닉 프로젝트 저희 이제 그린 수소 관련해서 지금 프로젝트를 진행하고 계신 월드 에너지 GH2의 어, 조셉 란 어, 부사장님께서 나오셔가지고 프레젠테이션을 해드리겠습니다. 그래서 이번에 이제 조셉 란 부사장님 그 발표가 끝나고 나서 어, 저희가 한 5분 정도 Q&A를 진행을 하려고 하거든요. 어, 들으시면서 궁금한 사항이 있으면 앞에 지금 발표하신 분들까지 해서 좀 궁금한 사항이 있으시면 생각하셨다가 어, 발표 끝나고 나서 어, 질문을 받도록 하겠습니다. 어서 조셉. Please come. Yeah, come back to protect the guests. First of all, thank you very much for your attendance, and it's an honor for me to be presenting our project. What I'd like to introduce you to is Canada's largest green hydrogen project. Its aim is to be one of the first commercial scale green hydrogen projects, if not the first. So this project is led by companies, individuals with strong expertise in our areas, uh, primarily around renewable energy, sustainable energy, such as sustainable aviation fuels, and then maritime expertise. The project is located in Newfoundland, Canada. And why Newfoundland, Canada? First and foremost, as been discussed, Canada is a country with tremendous natural resources. In this instance, we have world-class wind resources and abundance of water. It is also very close proximity to 
the European countries where there is a very strong demand and very ambitious decarbonization goals. And then lastly, the province itself consists of over 400,000 kilometers and yet lightly populated, about half a million people. And that makes it an ideal location for a wind-generated green hydrogen project. And this will be 100% green and zero carbon footprint. Now, the project itself is called Nugio Honig. It's a Mi'kmaq language, a First Nation language, that means where the wind blows. So I think the name itself is a clue that this area has tremendous wind resource. The project aims to be delivering by 2025, 2026, over 350,000 tons of green ammonia. The full project ultimately, over three phases, will build out three gigawatts of wind using one and a half gigawatts of electrolyzers and then ultimately producing over 700,000 tons of green hydrogen. Actually, 250,000 tons of green hydrogen, sorry, and over a million tons of green ammonia. Now, what does that mean? That's a lot of carbon reduction, over 700,000 tons per year. So let's talk about some of the attributes of this project itself. I mentioned that the wind quality is world class. Many people who are familiar with wind production, the wind quality here rivals North, the North Sea. It has a net capacity factor of over 50%. That is really you know, first in class. An average wind speed over 10 meters per second. What that means is it allows us to really produce at a high utilization. The other aspect about our location, of the project's location, is as you can see here, it has a deep seaport. So this is the actual picture of where the project will be located. It has over 10 meters uh, of depth that allows for large cargoes of shipments. And then importantly, within the port facility itself, which the project has acquired the land for the port, it is an existing uh, US military port that was still in very good shape. And so it allows for just minimal upgrade for it to be in production scale. And then the land itself is also where uh, we will be building out large electrolyzer plants that ultimately will continue to grow even beyond the three gigawatts of wind as the, uh, as the province itself can continue to build out additional wind farm. The location is a brownfield location, and it used to be a paper mill. So the repurpose of that paper mill for really the energy transition company and a project such as this means that we also have access to clean water. Again, electrolyzers, electrolytic hydrogen requires water. This site has high quality water that, re that will double the amount of the project's needs. So a lot of water is available. And then lastly, very importantly, the site itself is connected to a transmission line, 230 kilovolts. The importance, part, importance of this is that we are connected to hydropower. And so this region, during the winter months, when we happen to be blowing really strong wind, right, we can then export to the grid to support the province. And then in the summer months, when the wind quality or the wind frequency is a little bit lower, we're able to import hydropower that goes unused. So this has two really high you know, critical components. First and foremost, the wind itself is already an advantage for us to have high utilization. The hydropower will add to that. 
It also allows us to be certified 100% green, regardless of whatever certification is starting to be established. One of the strongest ones that are being established right now is in Europe, and we are able to meet all the criteria. The location, and lastly, it's not mentioned here, has a strong workforce component. So the First Nation population right now is traveling to other provinces to support the oil and gas, and many of them would very much enjoy the opportunity to support this project. And so an opportunity to really have strong skilled labor to execute a project of this ambition. So what this did was to set the stage for Canada and Germany to establish a hydrogen alliance. And back in August 23rd of 2022, the location itself was where Chancellor Schultz and Prime Minister Trudeau signed an agreement to have a transatlantic hydrogen supply from Canada to Germany. The agreement becomes a foundation that has target, that sets its target, the 2025-2026 I mentioned, to deliver shipments of green hydrogen or its derivatives, green ammonia. And with that, the Canadian government has really put the support behind the project, and the project itself continues to hit some very aggressive milestones. First and foremost, we were able to acquire the land, the port that, that was shown here. And then recently, we were awarded the crown land that allows us to build out the three gigawatts of wind. We also completed our uh, pre-feed. As you saw, SK is a very, very important partner. And with SK, we're able to push a very accelerated schedule to completing the pre-feed as, as of August. And we're on pace to wrap up feed by first quarter of next year and put ourselves in position for FID. We're also scheduled to get our permit by end of October. So if you look at all the projects, all the de-risking milestones, land acquisitions, engineering certainty, FID certainty, permit certainty, we're continuing to hit those aggressive targets. So then we can in fact be the world's first project and meet our commitment to deliver green molecules by 2025, 2026. I mentioned that the Canadian government has really supported us. This being a lighthouse project, a flagship project, Canada has provided two major incentives that will continue to augment the competitiveness of our project. The project stands alone in terms of the lowest cost green hydrogen project or lowest cost green hydrogen because of its natural attributes, but with the Canada's investment tax credits, as well as ultimately CFD with government interventions, it will allow green projects, green hydrogen projects, such as this one, to become the foundation for the growth of the green hydrogen economy. And all of this though, in Canada, would not be possible because of the strong partnership with the First Nation. And so, Halapu First Nation has been a very strong partner with us. They have been a strong advocate in the permitting process along the way, as well as providing labor force. And to ensure that it's successful, we are also working to be good corporate citizens by setting up educations, trade schools, so then the population can translate their oil and gas experience into the green energy experience. And while this project really started out targeting towards Europe, because that was the very first signal where strong demand would come from. As we progress and along our way, what we realize, all the attributes that I just mentioned, being making this project quite competitive, 
that once the shipment gets on water, it is really a very low marginal cost, whether it's heading to Europe or heading towards Asia. So what I'd like to share with the audience today is when we look through the economics of that and our understanding of Korea's ambition to decarbonize, particularly whether it's in your steel sector, whether it's in mobility, and importantly, whether it's in power generation. That ambition sets goals that are coming very soon. And we actually look forward to also being a real solution to meet some of the goals being set by Korea. So this wraps up the presentations. And as mentioned, we're welcome to take questions. <웃음> 네, 그러면 혹시 질문 있으시면은 네, 저기 선생님. Can you can, speakers can you wear your uh, translation device and uh, the channel number 3 for Korean and channel number 4 for uh, English? Yeah. The Andrew C. Slider is a joke of the young Jungle, Jum Chilmun is a Jasan Selmer, the Koshipos, or Chilmun at Rigo Shipundeo. Slider Jungle is a SM Arida Gohanenge, Nuclear Power Print, Sayongan, Yongwanji, Chapunta Jilmunigo. Tubunta Jilmunan, Ku. 블루 어, 하이드로젠하고 그 그린 하이드로젠과 관련돼서 텍스 크레딧이 같은 비율로 적용되는 건지 그두 가지 질문이 있습니다. 앤드류 Sure. Thank you very much for the for the question. Um, in terms of SMRs, that is something that uh, that we're developing, and I think there will be. Um, so, for example, in the province of Ontario, uh, there's a demonstration project coming together, and I think there's real interest across Canada, uh, particularly for some of our, our remote sites um, as well. Um, so that is very much a technology, and I understand uh, there is partnership between um, Canada and Korea as well to. Uh, put some of those technologies and SMR in place. So uh, really something uh, we are focusing on. Um, and I'm sorry, in terms of the question on, um, on the tax credits, um, so the slide that I have, and, and I'm happy for that to be shared, kind of has, has the big picture, but in terms of how that will be applied, that part is still uh, being developed by our by our finance department, who will decide on the specific tax measures there. I, I hope I under, understood the question properly. Hydrogen and the blue hydrogen can be a same tax credit or different late? I think that's being, being developed right now. I, in terms of the uh, department's um, positioning it's really on on carbon intensity so our, our minister prefers to talk about carbon intensity versus versus color so so given that I I, I believe that um, you know with the efforts to have uh, low carbon my sense that it would be the same but uh, said I can't speak on behalf of our our finance okay. colleagues there one more additional question about the SMR. Is there any reference? Is, is an ongoing project? Um, there are ongoing projects now, as I mentioned, in, in Ontario. Um, I'm not... I'm sorry? I'm sorry? New Brunswick as well. So there are a couple of firm projects that are, are coming together. And I said one of those is a partnership with, with South Korea.
is there any plan for the uh, starting generation, power generation? So there is, there is um, a test site um, where there was actually a plan to, it, it's going to be adjacent to an existing nuclear power plant, and so there's a plan to actually have that come, come online. Thank you. Uh, for Alberta, uh, Alberta, I was wondering if you guys are only thinking of blue hydrogen or ammonium, ammonium at the moment. And my second question is, are you guys also thinking of uh, exporting the liquid hydrogen instead of the ammonia? Maybe I can start first and then uh, you can go ahead next. Okay, uh, do you want me to speak in Korean or English? In, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, English then, uh, because you asked in English. Okay, uh, for Alberta, uh, as Andrew mentioned, it really doesn't matter what, what color the hydrogen is. Um, of course, we have a competitive advantage in blue. Blue hydrogen is our main thing. But uh, we also have uh, solar and wind other powers. Uh, we don't have nuclear at this time, but uh, there are other opportunities. So there are different R&D uh, projects focusing on uh, different technologies and blending hydrogen into different uh, usage. Uh, some of them are in Alberta Industrial Highland, some are in other parts of uh, the province. However, our main focus will be blue hydrogen and ammonia. At this time, we don't have a pipeline that's connects from where the hydrogen is produced and to the port. So it has to be railed and then put it in a special rail tanker, similar to LPG, like liquefied petroleum gas, and then put it into a rail tanker and then ship to uh, Prince Rupert and then export it to Asia. However, there are different projects of, you know, proposed projects for hydrogen pipeline. Uh, they're using existing petrochemical pipeline facilities or maybe uh, using whether it's liquid or other forms and mixing with other chemicals uh, or other gas and then, or different ways to transport efficiently and safely. So that's why there are so many different R&D projects that government is funding. So that's why we are promoting to Korean companies and Korean R&D institutions that if you want to test and pilot new technology in the storage and transportation of the hydrogen, what color it is, Arbor is a place to be. Um, that's, sorry, I don't speak in Korean, but I will try to talk very slowly. Um, so as Victor said, uh, we don't really care about the colors. Uh, we would like to have low cost, low CI level of hydrogen production or ammonia production. Uh, the reason why the seven companies, well, the, the seven company announced projects already, but we are working with more companies as well that haven't announced their projects yet. Um, but the reason why they're looking at blue hydrogen and the blue ammonia is because when the infrastructure, infrastructure is already in place, we have interconnected uh, fairly comprehensive natural gas network in the industrial park as of today. We already have CCUS infrastructure as of today. Um, so because, and also as Victor said, uh, there's already existing rail tracks going to the west coast in uh, west, western Canada. So the infrastructure exists as of today. And the second reason is mainly the cost and the scale. So it's relatively easier to reach the 1 million ton world-class ammonia scale using the existing technology, whether it's ATR um, or SMR technology. Um, the cost is fairly competitive because an, our natural gas is the lowest in North America and second lowest in the world. Um, when it comes to green hydrogen, as far as I know, um, is a little bit more challenging um, to be cost competitive compared to blue hydrogen, and the scale is relatively lower um, 
but I mean, um, as m my colleague here mentioned earlier, they're looking at larger scale green hydrogen as well. Uh, so I'm pretty sure there will be, you know, newer technologies in the future um, as coming up ramping up fairly quickly. Um, but as of today, uh, it's relatively easier to achieve the kind of scale blue hydrogen and the blue ammonia um, is, ha is having. Yeah. Opsisingaya. 네, 어 그리고 이제 마지막 저희가 발표가 남았습니다. 그래서 지금까지는 이제 브리, 저기 알버타하고 그다음에 동부 쪽에 있는 이제 수소 관련된 어 프로그램을 소개를 시켜드렸고요. 마지막으로는 브리티시 콜럼비아의 어 수소 관련된 그 케이퍼빌리티하고 이제 어드밴티지 관련해서 발표를 해주실 예정입니다. 그 BC 주정부에 BC 하이드로젠 오피스라는 조직이 있습니다. 거기에서 데이빗 코번 씨라고 이제 디렉터로 계시는데 아쉽게도 이제 오시지는 못하셨고요. 프레젠테이션 내용을 어, 미리 촬영해서 어, 지금 돌려드리겠습니다. 그리고 끝나시면은 궁금하신 사항은 저 뒤쪽에 저희 BC 그 어, BC 주정부 한국 오피스에서 근무하시는 상무관님이 계시거든요. 저희 제니퍼 맹 상무관님이 계셔서 잠깐 일어나 주시겠어요? 네, 상무관님께서 어, 뭐 관련된 정보나 아니면은 질문을 따로 받도록 하겠습니다. 그럼 지금부터 프레젠테이션을 한번 어, 보도록 하겠습니다. So hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is David Coburn. And I'm the director of the hydrogen team at the Clean Energy Major Projects Office within the British Columbia Ministry of Energy Mines and Low Carbon Innovation. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to quickly thank the conference organizers and sponsors, as well as our colleagues at Global Affairs Canada and the British Columbia Trade and Investment Office in Korea uh, for extending an invitation to allow me to speak on behalf of the province of British Columbia. Um, unfortunately, I was unable to attend the event in person, uh, but I'm very grateful to be able to join you virtually from beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia, which I respectfully acknowledge uh, is the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations, uh, whose historical relationship and profound connection with this land and its natural resources continues today. Um, the focus of my presentation is really going to be on BC's hydrogen opportunity, our capabilities and advantages as we see it. So before I dive into the presentation further, uh, I just wanted to quickly touch on our office's mandate and role. Um, the Clean Energy Major Projects Office is really a one-stop shop uh, for providing uh, project proponents uh, the dedicated support that's needed to advance clean energy projects like hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, uh, and other renewable projects aimed at fueling the low carbon future. Uh, this includes supporting projects across the full life cycle of the project, uh, including attracting investment, uh, helping proponents access funding programs, uh, helping them navigate BC's regulatory process, and advancing towards uh, construction and operation. Um, our office also works to build sort of the broader public awareness of BC's clean energy opportunities and engaging with federal and municipal governments and First Nations and communities and industry across our province. So for those of you who may not be very, very familiar uh, with British Columbia, we are Canada's westernmost province, uh, bordered by the Alaskan Panhandle and Yukon and Northwest Territories to the north, uh, and by Washington, Idaho, and Montana to the south. Uh, Alberta lies to the east and the Pacific Ocean to the west. Uh, BC is home to more than 200 First Nations, uh, each with their own unique traditions and strong cultural history, uh, as outlined in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. Uh, our government is fully committed uh, to partnering with First Nations across the province uh, to support their full participation and leadership on climate action uh, and to help create new economic opportunities across our vast province. BC also has a strong open economy uh, with GDP of 242 billion uh, and a population of 5.3 million people. Uh, BC has two of the country's largest ports. Uh, we have abundant natural resources, incredible natural beauty, 
and a competitive business environment and strong public services. Our, our largest city, Vancouver, uh, which is where I'm calling from, is one of the fastest growing low carbon economies in North America. So BC is really committed to transitioning to a greener economy and reaching net zero by 2050. Uh, the government of BC has set an ambitious climate plan called the Clean BC Plan and the Clean BC Roadmap to 2030 to ensure that we are acting with uh, strategically and with the greatest sense of urgency in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, as highlighted in these plans, uh, we recognize that we must change how we produce and how we consume energy. Uh, one such way is really to unlock the potential of hydrogen. Uh, and in 2021, uh, the BC government released the BC Hydrogen Strategy uh, to help us become a leading hydrogen economy by 2050. Uh, we believe this ambitious goal is very achievable uh, given our many natural endowments and competitive advantages, including location and infrastructure, uh, natural resources, our people, uh, and our robust regulatory, financial, and policy frameworks. So BC's prime location on North America's West Coast makes it very cost effective to do business around the world. Uh, our proximity to Alberta's large energy sector and the US and Asian markets mean we're connected through to these major markets through a fully integrated and extensive port, rail, air, and road transportation system. We have globally competitive deep water ports in Vancouver and British Columbia uh, Prince Rupert actually offers the shortest shipping distance to Asia from North America. Uh, we have five major international airports and 36 in total. Uh, we, we also have uh, quick access to the United States uh, through our many uh, land and sea border crossings. So, Unlike many other jurisdictions, uh, BC has the resources to produce both green and blue hydrogen with low carbon intensity and at scale. Uh, more than 98% of BC's electricity is clean, renewable electricity, allowing us to leverage our, uh, our capacity to produce green hydrogen via electrolysis. Uh, BC Hydro uh, is a regulated utility in BC. Um, it is well positioned to serve its customers' electricity needs over the next decade, and as the clean economy continues to evolve, is taking further actions to position itself to meet this increased electrification load associated with, with the government of BC's greenhouse gas reduction targets. So BC is also endowed with a vast natural gas reserves uh, and sig significant geological storage capacity, uh, particularly in the northeastern area of the province giving us the potential to produce blue hydrogen from natural gas with carbon capture storage. So to that end, uh, the province has actually partnered with Geoscience BC and the Centre for Innovation and Clean Energy to complete a, a geological carbon capture and storage atlas to identify the best potential CO2 storage locations in northeastern BC. So you can find this link to, the, to a link to that study and other relevant information at the end of this presentation. So given these natural endowments, uh, BC is fairly technology agnostic uh, and focused mainly on advancing all forms of low carbon energy production to meet our clean BC emission goals. Uh, we continue to see strong interest from companies around the world uh, with aims of producing hydrogen from clean renewable electricity to, through electrolysis or through pyrolysis or steam methane reforming with carbon capture and storage. So this is obviously very, very exciting, uh, and we strongly believe that these developing hydrogen opportunities will help to play a critical role in building our export potential or in reducing hard to decarbonize sectors where direct electrification is not practical, including in our medium and heavy duty transportation space and in industrial processes. So one key driver of competitiveness is policy certainty. Uh, and at BC, we have a very well-established and robust regulatory framework for new energy projects and for existing energy facilities. Uh, the, this robust framework is really critical to mitigating the environmental, safety uh, risks, and other risks associated with projects 
and to ensure First Nations and the public interests are really protected. Uh, in BC, the Environmental Assessment Office, the BC Energy Regulator, Technical Safety BC, and the BC Utilities Commission collectively form the backbone of our robust energy regulatory framework. Uh, the Environmental Assessment Office is a regulatory agency within the provincial government that conducts environmental assessments on major projects. Uh, the EAO, as it's called, ensures that any potential environmental, economic, social, cultural, and health effects that may occur during the lifetime of a major project are thoroughly assessed and mitigated. The BC Energy Regulator is the sole regulatory agency responsible for regulating oil, natural gas, and geothermal activities in BC. And on September 1st, 2023, uh, the BC Energy Regulator's mandate was just expanded to include hydrogen, ammonia, and methanol, and its powers expanded with respect to carbon capture storage reservoirs. These changes better reflect uh, the regulator's full scope of its responsibilities uh, and is more aligned with government's commitment towards reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and the transition to the low carbon energy. Technical Safety BC uh, is an independent self-funded organization that oversees the safe installation and operation of technical systems and equipment across the province. And finally, uh, the British Columbia Utilities Commission is an independent agency uh, of the government of British Columbia that regulates energy utilities. So another competitive advantage is uh, BC's innovative ecosystem and competitive business environment. Uh, this environment has helped to attract major investments such as LNG Canada and innovative clean energy technology companies from all, of, all over the world. Uh, just a few of the 70 plus clean energy companies that call BC home uh, are highlighted here on the screen. So we believe, however, BC's true competitive advantage is its people. Uh, we have a highly skilled and diverse workforce, and BC has a reputation as one of the most desirable places to live, which makes us a global magnet for talent. BC uh, has, a long, has long been at the forefront of uh, research in the province's hydrogen sector, um, educating the innovators who are really helping to unlock hydrogen's clean energy potential today. Post-secondary institutions and clean energy centers for excellence, such as UVIC's Institute for Integrated Energy Systems, University of British Columbia's Clean Energy Research Center, and others offer world-leading clean energy research and development capabilities. To enhance our standing across the world, uh, BC continues to make investments that build the skilled workforce needed for the clean energy future that's ahead of us. By supporting the development of training programs through initiatives such as the new Stronger BC Future Ready Action Plan, uh, BC can continue to offer the world a highly skilled and talented workforce, innovative products and services, and the technology and energy needed to power the domestic global clean economy. So what we're seeing around the world is jurisdictions really investing heavily into their transition to a clean energy economy. Canada and British Columbia are no different. Uh, we have developed various incentives and government policies to help attract and support clean energy development in British Columbia. In the 2023 federal budget, we saw unprecedented investment in clean energy with $21 billion over five years to grow the clean economy. And we expect that to grow to 80 billion by 2034. These investments are mostly in the forms of tax credits, which is a real shift from you know, historic direct subsidies to creating these kind of market incentive programs. Uh, the investment tax credits help to respond to the US Inflation Reduction Act, uh, and it supports the development of the energy sector infrastructure to advance decarbonization in uh, different areas, including new clean electricity generation, electricity transmission and storage, uh, hydrogen generation, and carbon capture storage. Uh, BC is also working very hard to develop and implement strong policies and programs that enhance the financial certainty to advance and develop clean energy supply and foster the creation of competitive clean energy hubs. To encourage growth in hydrogen, 
and the hydrogen sector uh, and other related clean energy pathways such as you know clean transportation and low carbon fuels uh, bc has implemented a number of funding programs including the clean bc industry fund uh, and the bc jobs manufacturing fund so in partnership with shell uh, bc has also helped to found the center for innovation and clean energy uh, to help accelerate changes in bc's clean energy ecosystem um, while this isn't, you know, an exhaustive list, I think it demonstrates that Canada and BC are working to create the conditions to enhance our competitiveness in the global clean energy economy. So, with a bit of an overview of, of BC's advantages and operating environment, um, I'll turn the focus to the opportunities. Uh, the global market for hydrogen is expected to reach more than 230 million tons in 2050. And naturally, we feel BC is very well positioned uh, to meet a portion of this demand by building our production capacity and by leveraging our innovative technologies and services. Uh, in parallel with our proximity to key export markets, uh, we believe our strong trading relationship with important energy partners like South Korea, the US, Japan, and China uh, will help to be mutually beneficial in reaching our respective clean energy ambitions. The Clean Energy Major Projects Office and our government colleagues are actively working to support BC companies and international companies looking to invest in BC to advance energy export projects uh, along our coast with the aims of producing hydrogen uh, and potentially converting it to things like ammonia for export to overseas markets. So, in parallel, we're also actively advancing projects to build our domestic supply and demand uh, as strong and resilient, uh, a strong and resilient domestic energy system is really needed to help achieve net zero by 2050. Uh, like many other jurisdictions, uh, we believe hydrogen will play a key role in reducing emissions across a wide range of sectors, including uh, light, medium and heavy duty transportation, uh, port operations, uh, in displacing natural gas in industrial and refining processes and displacing diesel for uh, use uh, that's used in electricity generation uh, in remote communities. So developing and supporting uh, regional hydrogen hubs in BC where production and demand can be co-located uh, is really a top priority uh, and our team is committed to identifying regions uh, that can really uh, realize the greatest decarbonization benefits. You know, these are things like seaports and industrial sites uh, and urban locations like UBC's city scale hydrogen test bed. So with that, uh, I just wanted to quickly touch on a few recent public announcements uh, in BC that highlight, I think, the terrific opportunities that we have here. Uh, so in June uh, 2023, uh, the BC H2 Ports Project was announced as the province's first large-scale two-year demonstration project to use hydrogen and fuel cells in the shipping and transportation sectors of port facilities uh, at Tawasin in the Lower Mainland, Victoria and Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. The Lower Mainland project is a collaboration between public and private sectors designed to showcase made in BC technologies uh, to support the province's decarbonization goals. Another project is the McLeod Lake Indian Band uh, Sakane project, uh, which recently announced plans to build a $5 billion hydrogen plant on the Kerry Lake East Indian Reserve, just north of Prince George. The project will be um, uh, producing hydrogen that will be converted to liquid ammonia, which would then be shipped by rail cars to, the port, to a port facility in Prince Rupert. Uh, in addition, there's a $2 billion straddle repro reprocessing plant that would also be built uh, to recover um, uh, methane and, uh, products. And on the north coast of British Columbia, Trigon Terminals has announced it's building a second berth with a focus on green energy uh, commodity products such as hydrogen and ammonia. Uh, this new berth, known as Berth 2 Beyond Carbon or B2BC, is expected to be operational by 2027 and there is currently work underway to advance the pile driving and construction of the work. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today 
Uh, I've included my email address. Should anyone wish to follow up with me by way of email after the conference, uh, I would be happy to have a discussion or provide any further information on BC's opportunities or advantages. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> 네, 이렇게 해서 두 시간 동안 저희가 진행했던 캐나다 데이 세미나를 모두 마치도록 하겠습니다. 어, 아까 그 안내 드린 대로 저희가 C10에 저희 캐나다 파빌리언 지금 운영하고 있고요. 어, 캐나다 그 수소 전 수, 수소 연료 전지 협회 그러니까 CHFCA하고 거기 계신 이제 같이 멤버로 나오신 기업체 그리고 지금 발표하신 저희 연사분들도 어, 이제 국가 간에서 만나실 수 있으니까 추가적으로 질문이 있으시면은 저희 국가 간으로 찾아오시면 되겠습니다. 어, 다시 한번 감사드리겠습니다. 고맙습니다.